I have six lightning talks, five minutes each. Um, and if I, I could ask the speakers to please keep an eye on Rachel sitting in the front row here. She's going to hold up a card for two minutes, then one minute, and then time. Um, we're going to try to strictly keep people on time so we can finish the session on time. And at the end of the lightning talks, I'm going to do a quick summary of what we heard in all 10 of the talks. Um, so to start, we have David Gertis, who's going to be talking about deep learning at the edge of the solar system. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm happy to talk with you about this today. And this work is done in collaboration with graduate student Kevin Napier, research scientist Ed Lynn, who are there in the back, and a group of really fantastic undergraduates in the Department of Physics. So I'm going to begin with a challenge. So this is a sequence of images that were taken with the six and a half meter Magellan Telescope down in Chile, a resource that's available to U of M researchers. And what you're seeing is a whole lot of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. But there's one interloper here, and I wonder if you can spot it. This is a lightning talk, so your time's up. <laughs> there it goes. So that's, uh, that's not a, uh, a, a UFO or a satellite or a star. At least it's not a UFO as far as we know. It's a Kuiper Belt object. It's one of many thousands of small icy worlds that live out in the solar system beyond Neptune. And uh, credit to Ed for finding this particular object. So you've undoubtedly heard of at least one Kuiper Belt object, the dwarf planet Pluto, but there are thousands of others. In fact, there's certainly many more in this set of images, but we can't see them. They're too faint to be seen in individual images. And so what I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes telling you about is how we are using deep learning to extract images, uh, extract Kuiper Belt objects that are too faint to be seen in any individual image. This is a particularly timely topic now. Up until a few years ago, no one had ever seen a Kuiper Belt object up close. And that changed dramatically when NASA's New Horizons spacecraft, which was launched in 2006, flew by the Pluto system and sent back amazing pictures like this. <clears throat> a couple of years later, it flew by an Ann Arbor-sized Kuiper Belt object called Arakoth and sent back these pictures. And it even observed uh, Ed's object at uh, closer range, obviously, than we can see it uh, from Earth. And, and there it is uh, in that picture. That was briefly the most distant image ever transmitted to Earth, a record that was broken the next time New Horizons uh, sent an image back. What else is out there? We have a once-in-a-generation scientific opportunity to find these objects. And perhaps, if we're super lucky, explore one up close. There's a little bit of fuel left on New Horizons to do this one more time. But we're facing a severe challenge. The brightness of these objects goes, uh, falls off like one over the distance to the fourth power. New Horizons is now 7.5 billion kilometers from Earth and moving through the Kuiper Belt at 50,000 kilometers an hour. So it's time sensitive and getting harder literally every day. So we need to take longer exposures to go deeper. That's the normal thing you would do in astronomy. And you just add those exposures together to get one big long exposure, just like this. But here's the problem. Our objects are moving. And so we can't just add them or stack them, as astronomers say, unless we could somehow track the telescope at the rate of the moving object. But we don't know the rate of an object that we haven't discovered yet. And so we have to do this in a different way. I will skip the pseudocode and just say that we, we have to combine the images at sort of every possible rate that an object might be moving at. So we do this about 100 times for each set of images. We uh, search for sources, you know, collections of bright pixels in each stack. But there's lots and lots of backgrounds. And every little defect in each image is, is multiplied by 100 times uh, for each stack. So the first neural net. Kevin Jr. <laughs> looks for round things. Round sources that are consistent with looking like a star are candidate uh, Kuiper Belt objects. The real rejection factor here is 100, but that's still much too much background. So we also look at how the shape of the object deviates from round when we don't quite match the moving rate correctly. It deviates from round in this characteristic radial pattern that is not what background sources would do. <clears throat> when we put all these together, we, uh, so far in our data, have discovered over, uh, over 2,000 candidate Kuiper Belt objects. And if you can visualize them in this mosaic, they seem to be forming some, some kind of pattern. <laughs> so here's the frontier. So there are many, many sources out there. Those were found in sequences taken four, minute, four hours uh, apart. What if our observations are taken days or months or even years apart? 
there are 14 points in this graph that correspond to the same object. I'm not going to challenge you with that. <laughs> but there they are. How the heck do those make the same thing? Well, here's the path that that particular object took over about three years on the sky. We are working now on GPU accelerated techniques to stack over many possible orbits of these objects to turn entire observing campaigns, maybe data taken with multiple instruments years apart, into um, a single effective long exposure. So that's the project, and we welcome your ideas and your collaboration. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Michael Meyer from AI to ET, image processing, spectral modeling, and population demographics to study planets around other stars. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and tell you about some of the research we're doing in the exoplanet research domain at the University of Michigan. Uh, exoplanets are planets that we find around other stars. And I guess in the early 90s, when I started uh, my education, you were sort of cutting edge if you knew some routines and numerical recipes in C, and a few uh, really cutting edge individuals would go on to do neural network work, uh, similar to what we heard about a, a couple of minutes ago. Um, but now, machine learning and AI is used in many branches of astrophysics, uh, as you probably could guess. And what I'm going to tell you about are three projects where finding planets around other stars, trying to characterize them, and ultimately, ultimately, looking for signatures of life on worlds beyond our own solar system is the goal that we want to try to reach to. The first uh, thing I'm going to tell you about is to try to suppress the light from a very bright star so that we can see faint things at very small angular separations that are moving about those stars. After we find the planets, we want to characterize them by taking high signal to noise infrared spectra so that we can discern different molecules in their atmospheres which tell us ultimately about their composition and as I alluded to someday trying to find signatures of non-equilibrium chemistry in their atmospheres which might be a signature of life. We also want to understand our formation theories to make predictive models of how these planetary populations come to be and evolve. And that is a complex problem where we want to tease out subtle correlations in multi-dimensional spaces. So, first off, how do we find the planets? Well, we use a technique called adaptive optics. AO is the process of taking a mirror in our optical system and having thousands of actuators on it, tiny little pistons we push and pull, and we update the form of that mirror several thousand times a second. The goal is to remove optical aberrations from the telescope, from the instruments, or most commonly from the atmosphere so that we can see faint things near bright things. And people are using AI to adapt these techniques and make them better. The first problem that we would like to take another step towards is instead of using what is commonly used as this uh, beam splitter to take some of the light to do the reconstruction, we would like to make the reconstruction measurements in the focal plane itself. And that requires some uh, delicate uh, balancing between using the information that we're trying to detect planets with and destroying it and using it to update the control system uh, that would obviate the need to have a different optical path for the reconstruction measurements versus the science images that we want. The other problem we would like to take steps to avoid is a time lag. It's a few thousand times per second, but even so, you could imagine building models of predictive control based on a training data set, a history, that would allow you to take leaps into the future to try to correct problems you haven't yet measured in either the focal plane or the reconstruction. Both of these techniques would allow us to detect uh, planets nearby bright stars, and they also have a huge amount of training data that we could use to train the uh, neural nets and the algorithms we would like to use. The second problem is a bit more uh, mundane in a sense. We have spectra that we take of these planets, and we want to try to understand the planetary atmospheres. Historically, these have, models have been made by great leaps in forward modeling where you assume a huge amount of very constraining input physics. 
The models are sophisticated and interesting, but they do not match the data. So what we've done in the past decade is take more of a phenomenological approach, where we try to parameterize our atmospheres in a million ways that make them simpler to compute, but non-realistic. And we build millions of models over a 30-dimensional parameter space to try to pull out and tease out fundamental parameters of the atmospheres. This is a kind of way where we would use a neural network to speed up the computation by just using a pre-computed grid. We have thousands of data points at high signal to noise, and we try to discern the properties of the models. And as I said, ultimately, we would like to find signatures of life in these uh, planetary spectra. And finally, we want to understand the process of planet formation and evolution. This is a process over many dimensions, uh, 10, 15 orders of magnitude, coupled uh, feedback loops uh, that are nonlinear and time dependent. It's a very, very complicated modeling problem, and we don't have much to go on. We measure the demographics of planetary systems in multiple dimensions, and trying to tease out subtle correlations between these multiple dimensions would give us characteristic scales or discontinuities in the model space in order to constrain our theories. I don't know what agents we would look for here, so I guess we could think of them as secret agents. If anybody's interested in talking to us about this problem, uh, please let me know. Thank you. All right, we'll take a beat to get the next slides up. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Yang Chen talking about data science in space weather forecasting. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to talk about my uh, collaborative research that actually initiated from a conversation that I had at Weiser Hall in Midas. Uh, that was back four years ago. And we have made quite a bit of progress in the past four years. I'll do a very brief uh, showcase of some of our results. Uh, so here I just want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators from the Cl Climate Science and Space Science Departments. Um, so space weather is different from terrestrial weather that we talk about every day. We talk about rain and sun, sunny days. Uh, in terrestrial weather, but space weather is the discipline that studies the conditions between the sun and the earth. Um, and in particular, we focus on several space weather events that can, uh, that can have uh, big impacts on different kinds of uh, human life uh, and human explorations. The first thing is called the solar flare events. Uh, these kind of events can produce very strong X-rays that can degrade or block high-frequency radio waves used for radio communication during events such as radio blackout storms. Uh, something that's even stronger is called the solar energetic particles. Those can penetrate satellite electron, ex electronics and cause electric, uh, electrical failure, block of radio communications at high latitudes at, uh, in, during solar radio s storms. Uh, and the other thing related is called the coronal mass ejections. Those can cause geomagnetic storms at Earth and induce extra currents in the ground that can degrade the power grid operations. So in general, those kind of solar, solar events uh, can be very disrupted for radio communications uh, and also can be really uh, dangerous if we want to send astronauts to the universe. Um, so the, the key goal for a lot of our projects is to monitor in real time and also do early, uh, early range forecasting of those kind of uh, solar events. So uh, this is the bill page uh, slide that my collaborators uh, sent it to me. So essentially just saying that in the past few years, uh, different kind of national agencies has been putting on a lot of emphasis on early forecasting of space weather events. And traditionally, for this field, the predictions are done by first the principal methods. That's the physics-based models. Uh, they run a lot of numerical simulations. And nowadays, we have been relying more on data-driven methods, uh, conditioning on the fact that we have a lot of high-resolution, large volumes of data being collected every day. So for me, those have been, OK, I only have one of my two videos loaded. That's fine. 
Uh, so we have a lot of different kinds of data products uh, in, uh, that we collect all the time. Uh, we collect the line of sight and vector map, maps. We collect different kinds of images in real time. So this uh, video that you just uh, saw is, uh, is a solar eruption event, uh, and we have these kind of videos recorded all the time since 2010. And we also have different kinds of imaging data uh, coming from those videos. Uh, and we have uh, processed the data. For example, we identified the important regions on the sun, on the solar disk, and we call them active regions. And we calculate physical quantities that are really important uh, for forecasting solar flare events. Uh, and we have vectored time series type of predictors. And also we have uh, different kind of uh, geomagnetic indices uh, that's being monitored uh, in real time. So that gave us a lot of opportunities and challenges from a purely data science perspective. We have very high spatial and temporal resolution of data, uh, and in very large volumes, we have very mixed data types uh, from different instruments, and some of them are miscalibrated across different instruments, and we're interested in operational forecasting but of very rare but strong events. So we have from a machine learning perspective, we have very unbalanced data, uh, and we're trying to monitor things in the real time. So some of the parameters can be processed in real time, and some others are delayed in real time. Um, and we do have some knowledge of fundamental understandings of that physical process that drives the model behind it. And we aim at having interpretable and reliable models uh, with the quantified uncertainty for decision-making process. Uh, and we want to give data-driven discovery of new physics. So I'm showing three different figures that I have uh, in three of my different papers in this field. So on this, top, uh, on this bottom left figure is one of our work on, on real-time forecasting of solar flare events. In the middle, we are trying to fill in a global geomagnetic index map. And on the right, we're trying to do real-time forecasting of another geomagnetic index uh, event uh, with interpretable machine learning. Am I running out of time? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so three lightning talks down, three to go. Next, we're going to hear from Atul Prakash talking about designing robust machine learning classifiers. Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so let's see. Okay, and this is a forward button. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, kind of research we do, and I'm interested in collaboration with application areas. So I'm in computer science, um, and uh, kind of applications uh, which I think uh, where some of our work might be applicable is things like autonomous driving, uh, healthcare. Um, so the work that we're doing is on looking at robustness of machine learning classifiers. So in a kind of work that we have done in the past is kind of shown that you can kind of fool machine learning classifiers by, say, putting stickers on physical objects that they are trying to interpret. So for example, in an autonomous car situation, uh, if a car is trying to read what a traffic sign is, uh, like a camera is trying to interpret these images, it turns out that given a classifier, we can figure out uh, from a security perspective what stickers to place so that the classifier will make a mistake. So here's an example that's seen as a 45 speed limit sign or some other speed limit sign. Uh, so we kind of did that work back in 2018. Um, and then uh, that had a whole lot of impact at that point. It got a lot of attention. Uh, for example, it uh, sort of raised questions about AI's trustworthiness. Can you trust AI? in these safety systems. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of articles. And in fact, our traffic sign that we worked on, one of them is right now, it's, it's displayed in the London Science Museum um, uh, for education purposes uh, for the community. To kind of think about, like, AI might have different blind spots than humans do. Uh, and then there was a DARPA program that also got started uh, looking at AI robustness. So some of the work that we have done recently has been on both the attack side, that is, we want to test robustness 
of classifiers uh, because we need to know the blind spots. And also on defense side, which is like, how do you make classifiers more robust? So in the time I have, maybe I'll mention briefly some work we're doing called graphite, which is looking at generating these perturbation attacks that given an ob object or an image, you can figure out how to perturb it so that you know, given a classifier, you can fool that classifier. And so that work appeared recently. And then there's some ongoing work uh, which uh, is looking at deep fake, deep fake problem. Um, so, um, so just to give you an example of type of things that graphite does is that uh, given a, a particular classifier, say for traffic signs detection or classification, uh, it can take an image of a traffic sign and then generate the perturbed version that will fool that particular classifier. So here are examples on the right which show certain like example outputs. We actually field tested some of these things. So we bought a traffic sign uh, you know, online and then got it delivered and then tested it. Um, and s similar thing uh, we did with license plate readers. So in this case, the attack is on a license plate reader where we are changing the border. And so can you change the border around the license plate reader which somebody could construct or buy and then cause the license plate reader to get confused or misread uh, the license plate. Uh, so these are some examples. Uh, we've also done like generally work on images in general. So you could imagine instead of this is for CIFAR 10, but this could really be a medical image. So let's say you're trying to detect cancer or something else. Uh, then question is uh, you can test robustness uh, potentially using graphite. Uh, so, uh, so we're interested in exploring other application domains, obviously. Uh, so one of the ones is, of course, medical imaging. But then we're also working with, uh, or planning to work with uh, 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 people in civil engineering. They design robots for construction industry. And we are interested in looking at how to make them more trustworthy uh, for human safety. And uh, drones and autonomous driving as well. Now, I'll briefly mention some of the defense work we are doing. So deep fake is a big societal problem. Uh, where uh, basically AI can be used to generate uh, very realistic, hyper-realistic images and videos. And the question is, how do you sort of, uh, like, detect them? So, so there are defense techniques out there which have been published. Unfortunately, you can use adversarial techniques, that kind of things we have done on the attack side, to cause a deep fake to bypass the uh, detector. Uh, so you can take a deep fake, which is detected properly on the left side, but then you add adversarial noise to it to overcome the detector, and now the deep fake still works. So we are doing some work on the defense side. The key takeaway here is that defense actually requires us to understand the domain. So that's why I think it's really important for us to collaborate with people in application domains, because we need to understand it to build effective defenses. Uh, so in this case, we had to go to frequency domain analysis to do this. OK, so to conclude, we are doing all this interesting, cool work on understanding robustness, and we are interested in working with uh, all of you out there. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to hear from Alex Gorodetsky, Uncertainty in Decisions, Tools for Bayesian Inference, and Uncertainty Quantification in Science. Thanks. Uh, so I'm in, I changed my title a little bit, but it's okay. It's a similar thing. Uh, I'm Alex Rudetsky. I'm in the Aero department. I'm mainly methods developer. So this talk is from a perspective of working with a lot of uh, domain experts. So in, in, from my perspective, you know, the reason for science and engineering is we want to create predictive models. We want to create predictive models so that we can do things with it, predict the future, design things better, control things better. And up until quite recently, we had to rely on uh, predictions entirely built by these uh, men and women who designed or developed very generalized uh, models of the world that really apply to, to anything. And that was quite amazing. Uh, they developed physical models, statistical models uh, to be able to predict uh, pretty much anything. And they could still predict pretty much anything. The only issue is that we now have computational issues. Uh, where uh, predicting certain things using the laws uh, derived by these folks uh, might take too much computational power. And any time you start uh, then making simplifications, you become 
uh, right, uh, the problem becomes rife with uncertainty. And so my work tries to deal with this uncertainty, uh, uncertainty in, uh, associated with using data and updating models, uh, so, uh, uncertainty associated with using models to make predictions. These uncertainties are, are uh, everywhere. For example, your da data is noisy, your data is sparse. You might have huge data, but it's only relevant to one small aspect of the problem and so you still have uncertainty. You may have a fantastic model, let's say, of how you predict drag on an air, uh, aircraft, but you don't know the temperature where it's flying, you don't know the gusts that are hitting it. Anytime you try to use a model in the real world, there are many things you don't know. And so uncertainty is a very critical aspect that we need to understand, manage, uh, and then predict with in order to make decisions that are reliable, robust, and interpretable. And so what, I, what I'm going to show you is, is, is true, regardless of whether you use models developed by these folks or with the new explosion of data-driven models. We still have to go through the same process of taking data, updating models that we have, parameter tuning, making a predictions, developing new data uh, and new experiments to collect new data and make sense of predictions. So instead of uh, going through some projects, which I, I can do uh, as well at the end, I'll put up a slide, I'm just going to say how I work with applications people where they come up to me and I try to help them solve their problems. So for example, they come up to me and they say, I have this data, can you predict the future? And if all they give you is data, you should immediately say no because that's not all, you, all they know. They know, uh, for example, where it comes from, what's relevant, and all of this needs to be used. So for example, I ask them, okay, where does it come from, what do you need? For example, if a fluid dynamicist comes to me and they said, I have these lift drag data, I want to predict how my aircraft is going to fly, I say, okay, that's great. And also, this is a regime in which we have really nice models. We have computational fluid dynamics models. And so what we can do is we can take your data, we can update the parameters, maybe boundary conditions, uh, turbulence parameters, initial conditions. We do inference learning. So I develop algorithms, for example, for Bayesian learning, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo variational inference algorithms. Then we learn, and then we want to make predictions. But now we want to make predictions, it's still uncertain. Just because you know the parameters doesn't mean you know how to fly, you might again have gusts. Uh, then somebody might come to me and say, here's my LIDAR data. And I say, it's too complicated, we don't have a good physics model to map uh, dogs cr running across the road to what they look like on LIDAR, so we're going to replace the model with the neural network. Same exact process, we do inference and learning to learn the neural network weights, we then make predictions. Uh, somebody might say, here's my data for weather, and I want you to make predictions on weather is in the, uh, three days. And immediately you should say this is impossible because this is a chaotic system. So sometimes you need to make probabilistic predictions, probabilistic models. So here we take weather models, we get data, we update states, and we can use them within a dynamical model after we do state estimation to get probability of future weather, especially in dynamical systems. Um, and so my work spans on uh, all of these different areas, computational tools uh, to propagate uncertainty through model, whether physics or neural network or whatever, um, to then develop new experiments with Bayesian experimental design to determine how do we collect new data so that it's very effective uh, to learn what we want to do. We then collect the data, we do inverse problems, calibrate the parameters, uh, understand their uncertainty to update and refine our models. Uh, my approaches are typically computational, so I work uh, mainly in the, the box above, we develop algorithmic tools to help automatic discovery of structure to aid in the analysis and prediction of models and the assimilation of data. My goal is to make general tools that can then be applicable to a wide, ver uh, wide variety of application areas. So for example, here are some application areas, and I'll end with, that we work on. For example, we do uh, inverse design of so soft robotic systems. If you see how a jellyfish uh, floats and you want to mimic it, how do you reverse engineer to how you should build that gel in the first place? We also work with electric propulsion folks. So these people build uh, propulsion things that go out in space and explore other planets. Uh, here we want to help them design. Models are very uncertain. How do we help them design? We do this for automotive system. We do this for learning of dynamical systems. If you're an for applications purpose uh, person interested in predicting with models or using data, please come talk to me. I'm very happy to talk with you. Okay, we move on to our last lightning talk, and after this, I'm going to take a few minutes to try and summarize what we heard. Uh, we're going to now hear from uh, Yunshin Bayan, um, digital twin calibration. It looks like we have a, a, a substitute speaker. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, hello everyone, I'm Enchim Bai, I'm from Industrial and Operations Engineering. So I'm going to present my recent research on distal twin calibration. Uh, so as many of you know, advances in numerical algorithm and computing power bring digital twins to the forefront of operational analytics and also the optimal uh, management of many applications. So here the digital twins is a virtual representation of actual system or actual process as a real-time digital compartment. And it can be useful for condition monitoring, for diagnosis and prognostics. And also when uh, we actually, when you cannot test the real system, uh, we can use these star twins to see the performance of new control schemes or new operational schemes. Uh, this is the example of this star twin in the wind power system. So here, this is uh, the. I cannot see this. Yeah. So this is the layout of wind power uh, wind farm system in the uh, actual wind farm in Indiana. So the blue that's uh, wind turbines and red that's uh, metro last tower that measure all these weather conditions and. Uh, each turbine, this a blue dot, each turbine has uh, you know, several sensors, also control systems and actua actuators. Like uh, in the sensors, we have acoustic sensors, vibration sensors to monitor the system condition. And uh, for the control system, we have pitch uh, control system to, you know, to control the pitch angle. And also we have your control system to change the your offsets. And all the data from these sensors and control systems are collected through the SCADA system. And then based on this data, wind farm operator, they build digital twins. So there could be a wind farm level digital twin to uh, you know, control wake effects, which I'm going to talk about a little later. And also there could be a turbine level digital twin. So here, my focus is not developing digital twin itself, but uh, my research is to improve or enhance the performance or the accuracy of digital twin. So in many cases, these digital twins are developed based on physics-based first principles, and it requires certain parameters to be specified. But unfortunately, in some cases, these parameter values are unknown a priori. So my research is to uh, identify these parameter values using the actual data. So here, uh, we have actual system, and uh, this actual system responds to the operational condition and generates some output. And we have this digital twin computer model. Of course, we have input operating condition, and this digital twins will generate simulation output. But in addition to this operational condition, we need to set some parameters. So we want to uh, identify these, par these uh, parameters such that the system output can be close to the digital twin output. So our goal is to make digital twin repre represent near exact replica of actual system via parameter calibration. So here is one example. In the wind pump system, uh, the turbine operation is not independent because of the wake effects. As you can see, the upstream turbines, they generate additional turbulence. Uh, so the downstream turbines performance really depends on upstream turbines operational scheme. And to, uh, to characterize this kind of interactions between turbines, people uh, make this uh, digital twin model, wake effects model. And in the wake effects model, there are some parameters that need to be specified. And in the literature, they said you need to use 0.75 for land-based wind farm, 0.04 for offshore wind farms, but our data does not really say those are the optimal parameters. Uh, another application is the building energy system, BES. Uh, building energy model uh, becomes quite popular because we can use this building energy model or the digital twin of building, uh, build, actual building energy to control the smart building systems. In these building energy models, there are many parameters that need to be specified, and these are the subset of parameters. And so some of the parameters need to be employed throughout the year, but some parameters uh, season dependent, like a cooling season parameter or a heating season parameters. In automotive application, parameters show some hierarchical structure. Uh, some parameters really you know, apply to all the vehicles in the same model. Some parameters vehicle specific, and also some parameters are trip specific. So they show some this hierarchical parameter structure. And in the <laughs> so the equation is messy. So these uh, parameter calibration can be expressed as this simple equation. How can we minimize the difference between model output and actual data? So simply, how can we minimize loss function? 
So it's very simple, but there can be many different uh, challenging issues. So basically, each application is different, as I said. There could be hierarchical structure, there could be seasonal dependencies. So maybe we cannot use just a single loss function. We may need to use multiple loss functions that may be correlated and also maybe compete each other. Uh, also, we may have large dimensional parameters. Okay, so we have scalability issue and we have large dimensional data. So there are lots of challenges, but uh, you know, lots of data also means good opportunities. So we use this uh, data to advance these digital twins, and in the end, we want to use this well-calibrated digital twins to improve our systems or our processes. Thank you. Wow, lightning talks are really fast. That was, uh, that was a lot of information, um, but a great series of talks. Um, so I'm Bill Curry, I'm in C's, and uh, what I'm gonna do is try to summarize what we heard. So the AI, we've been, uh, this session was organized around this new AI in science postdoctoral fellowship program. Waiting for the next slide to come up. I press the down one now. Yeah, the down high. Ah, sorry. So this new postdoctoral program is not only going to fund and train 60 new postdocs, it's also, it's also an opportunity to catalyze new AI and science training and research among other postdocs, graduate students, and researchers across the university. And this is part of the goal of the sponsor. Today what we tried to do was to get 10 far-ranging talks um, to get you to think about the breadth of this program and inspire you to think of creative new approaches and new potential collaborations. And my task is to talk a little bit about what we heard in these 10 talks. So I made this word cloud from the abstracts. On the website, there are abstracts from these 10 talks. This gives us a sense of some of the concepts that were common across many of the talks, systems, learning, data, parameters, uncertainty, manufacturing, physical, and also some of the smaller words give us a sense of what was different among the talks, um, but still notable enough to be uh, used several times. Decisions, deep fake, forest, weather, animals, attacks, molecular. And as Jag explained earlier, per the sponsor, Schmidt Futures, they put these four categories um, they put work in AI into these four categories. I looked through everyone's slides and I tried to put them into these categories, recognizing um, that our research really does not fall easily into a category and you, your work probably falls in more than one and you might it, put it somewhere else, so I apologize for that. But what this allowed me to do was take the departments those speakers are associated with um, and put those into these categories. It's an interesting way to view the UM departments that are represented in these 10 talks. It shows an incredible breadth of topics and domain areas. And I'm sure that each of these methodologies is being applied um, in a much wider set of domains at the University of Michigan. I think maybe a good goal for our program would be when we look back on this postdoc program in a few years, that all of these departments are represented in the mentors um, and many more. That's the kind of stimulation research uh, that this program is trying to bring to Michigan. So I'm going to go through some key takeaways from these 10 talks. Across this wide range of topics and approaches in terms of applying AI and science and engineering, what were some of the key takeaways we heard? Um, recognizing that this is what one person heard, okay, you all probably heard something different. Molecular conformation. Large molecules have the problem of combinatorial expansion using reinforcement learning on subunits. Teach the agents to learn the easy parts first, like we teach students. I thought that was a really interesting insight. Um, the subunits, learn those first. That can combat combinatorial expansion. Next, monitoring primate movements in the wild. Instead of outfitting the animals with sensors, outfit the forest with sensors. Track individually identified animals, which is needed for behavioral ecology research, using facial recognition and vocalizations. 
Next, integrating AI in manufacturing. Manufacturing systems that learn and make decisions in a dynamic environment using a dynamic knowledge base with human and AI workers working together. Next, we heard about the Internet of Things. Computational power is increasing at the edges, and it represents an opportunity. For example, using a car as computing power continue to continually update the model of the degradation of its own battery based on driving behavior and environmental conditions. And we also heard that the Tesla autopilot system has 150 million times more compute power than Apollo 11 did. I thought it was a very interesting um, piece of trivia. Then we heard about a different kind of edge, the edges of the solar system. Combining data from multiple telescopes, multiple nights, even months or years apart, combined with neural network-based image analysis to discover fainter, farther moving objects. Next, thousands of exoplanets. I did a quick search yesterday to see how many confirmed exoplanets there are. There are over 5,000 as of last March. Um, I don't think it's gonna be long before it's tens of thousands or, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of confirmed exoplanets. Leveraging this new large data set, both for empirical discovery and for the building of theory. Solar science and space weather, using mixed data types to forecast rare, strong solar flares to minimize disruptions to society that include navigation, communication, and power grids. Next, adversarial attacks on your deep neural net, working with both attacks and detection, deep fake design and detect. I thought it was really interesting to hear about a deep fake that was detected, then some pixels were altered, and the deep fake could no longer be detected. I can't help thinking of this as a new kind of arms race. Uncertainty quantification for simulations. In our simulations, what do we know and what don't we know? Computational tools, including neural nets, can help us to know our unknowns, and this is applicable across a wide range of problems. Finally, digital twins, keeping them identical. A digital twin is a simulation meant to represent a real system, so it needs physical parameters, but some of the parameters can be hard to observe or hard to estimate. Big data can help power estimates of the unobservable physical parameters and help the digital twin better mirror the target system. We heard about applications in wind turbines, electricity grids, and cars. That's a lot of different topics, uh, different approaches that we heard about, very, very creative combinations of methodologies and domain science. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all of the speakers again.